Good morning to the 46th annual study day delivered by yesterday by Miriam Berger and Joanna Skrovonska. And today we continue with this responses delivered by Val Parker and Ivan Urli. Good morning, everybody online. Good morning, Stefan, Alfonso, and Tia, and everybody who is listening to us online. This year, the topic highlights the unique combination between witnessing and horizontality provided by analytic groups. It confers to discipline a role and a tool to support persons and groups in the post-syndemic pandemic turbulent times we are living in, because we are really living in turbulent times. This responsibility connects me to Walter ben Benjamin's and Paul Klee's Angelus novels, inspiring the author to write about the concept of history. It's interesting because I was, um, and the day before I was traveling here, I, I thought that it was important to bring this contribution for us, especially, and it, it matches as exactly what we are living in, the confluence between the past, the present, and the future, and how it's intertwined. And Benjamin is special on describing and talking about it. So I will read a small part of what he says. There is a painting by Klee called Angelus Novus, depicting an angel contemplating and fixating on an object, slowly moving away from it. His eyes are open wide, his mouth hangs open, and his wings are outstretched. This is exactly how the angel of history must look. His face is turned towards the past, where we see the appearance of a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which unceasingly piles rubble on top of rubble and hurls it as his feet. Much as he would like to pause for a moment to awaken the dead and piece together what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from heaven. It has caught itself up in his wings and is so strong that the angel can no longer close them. The storm drives him irresistibly into the future to which he turns his back while the heap of rubble in front grows sky high. What he calls Call what we call progress is this storm. Yesterday and today, we visit and revisit man made catastrophes and listen to testimonies. But together, face to face or online, taken by the storm blowing from heaven and in the company of the angel of history we will be resistibly driven into a hopefully more responsible future. This is my wish for us as group analysts. And this is what I think it's important to, to bring, especially about yesterday. Well, I introduce our first speaker, Val Parker, is a psychodynamic psychotherapist, group analyst, supervisor, teacher, and writer, and runs a private practice from her home in Oxfordshire. She's a clinical supervisor on the qualifying course at the Institute of Group Analysis in the UK, and a training group analyst for the qualifying course in group analysis in Albania, who is uh, the, the first cohort is graduating this, 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 these days. No? She's a visiting lecturer in, in the University of Oxford Psychodynamics Studies Program, the Oxford Foundation course, 
and Group Analysis, and the Diploma in Group Analytic Practice at Turvey. Her book, A Group Analytic Explorations of the Sibling Matrix, How Siblings Shape Our Lives, was published by Routledge in 2020. It's on sale outside. So please welcome to, to talk about sibling witnessing in the horizontal axis, please. Thank you. I'm very nervous. Thank you so much, Miriam, for your moving and thought-provoking lecture. I appreciate your personal courage in inviting us to bear witness to your traumatic childhood experience. It is poignant to hear the difference it made for you when you discovered many years later that another child had been there with you and remembered. You had not been alone after all. You had a witness. Sibling witnessing. Witnessing, as Miriam emphasizes, belongs in the horizontal axis. It involves being alongside another, and it begins with siblings. My sister, who is four and a half years younger than me, often phones me and asks what I remember about certain events in our family. Did it happen, she says? Am I remembering it right? As I'm older, I can often validate memories that for her feel hazy or uncertain. I can attempt to explain things for her. I may not be correct. I may have misunderstood or misremembered. My memories are not necessarily facts, but what really matters to her is that I was there. I can tell her how I saw it, and I can verify that the event took place. She was not imagining our mother's fury when she daubed red paint on the wall. And she can help me remember seeing the bloody sheets and the empty space in the bed when mum was in hospital after losing her baby. The way my sister and I can fill in gaps and elaborate for one another is so important. It would not have been the same to have asked one of our parents because their perspective would have been entirely different. Siblings who share the experience of growing up together are constantly acting as one another's witnesses. And I think this is a vital aspect of the sibling matrix. Books famously said that we are social through and through. This implies that from the moment we are born, we are seeking connection with others like ourselves. Others who can be companions or friends, others who we can differ from and compare ourselves with, others with whom we can fight and make up, others who can be bystanders and speak up for us. This begins with our siblings, and if all goes well, we expect to be alongside one another throughout our lives, witnessing one another's joys and sorrows, witnessing the deaths of our parents, witnessing the new generation coming forth. I differ from some sibling theorists, believing that this drive to connect is innate. Evidence from infant observations and studies of twins in the womb show that siblings are from the very start drawn to one another. We will inevitably move in and out of closeness with our brothers and sisters. We may fall out irretrievably, but our siblings will always have a place in our inner worlds, even if this is painful or empty. So if a sibling is lost or dies, it is a profound and unimaginable loss leaving a gaping hole in our psyches. So I was thinking about Miriam and her brother. Miriam tells us that her infant brother was killed in the camps and that his loss meant that she became especially precious to her parents. She reflects on how she needed to survive for them. She had to fill his space too. What a responsibility. But what about her loss? She lost her brother, her companion and bystander. She lost her witness. When Miriam discovered that a boy had been under the other bed, I think she also found a missing brother, someone who could momentarily fill the gaping hole. If her brother had survived, they probably would have been together when the event occurred, 
comforting one another. So perhaps the knowledge of this brotherly presence was also an important factor in Miriam's healing. Therapy as witnessing. <laughs> Miriam's lecture has highlighted a crucially important but overlooked function of therapy to bear witness. When patients feel safe enough to share their traumatic experiences with us, we are taken there with them. In group therapy, members through their horizontal positioning will continually act as one another's witnesses. I will talk about this later. But in individual work, the therapist could only function effectively as a witness by getting alongside their patients. In other words, they need to become a sibling therapist. Witnessing in therapy is still a relatively unexplored area. And I would like to draw your attention, as did Johanna, to Stolper's excellent chapter in Ashwach and Behrman's new book on siblings and horizontality mentioned by Miriam. Over time, many attempts have been made to bring siblings into sharper light in psychoanalytic discourse, including a seminal paper by the American psychoanalyst Eloise Agar written in 1988. In this paper, Aga describes her work with a priest who was the youngest of 13 children. In one session, he was talking at length about, quotes, the continual harsh and inhibiting restrictions put upon his childish curiosity and sexual explorations by his parents. Aga presumed he was also referring to her, but was puzzled by his manner, writing, quote, he seemed quite cheerful, even conspiratorial. Nevertheless, she suggested to him that perhaps he found her harsh too. He laughed. Oh no, I think of you as one of my brothers or sisters and sometimes all of them, and the way we consoled each other after the beatings. It's interesting that Agar assumed he saw her as a parent. By being a sibling therapist, she was offering a space where she could be a witness to his terrors rather than one of the perpetrators. It is clear how helpful this was, allowing space to loosen the parental grip on his psyche. So to be a witness in individual therapy means stepping into the sibling transference. In my book on the sibling matrix, I describe working with a patient I called Margaret. She had lost her father when she was young and had a complex entangled relationship with her mother and her older sister. About a year or so into our work, Margaret had a series of dreams which led us into working rather differently. To us, the dreams indicated that she needed to step away from her mother and that we needed to do this together. In the first dream, she's in bed with her mother who is crushing and suffocating her. She cries out, but her mother doesn't hear. We talked about her mother's over-attentiveness and invasiveness, but also her fear that I might not hear her or that she might be crushed or suffocated in the sessions. In the second dream, she asks her mother if she loves her. Her mother ignores her. Margaret asks her repeatedly and meets the same response. Distraught, she turns to her sister and asks the same question. Her sister says she doesn't know. Desperate, Margaret decides to leave. She woke with the thought that she was seeing me that day. The third dream was a recurrent childhood dream which she recalled at this time. She's in a strange house. She has been asleep and wakes screaming. She goes to her mother's room, but the door is closed. She walks along the corridor to her sister's room. The door is open. She enters and sits on her bed. We felt the dreams indicated a search for a sister who would listen. In the second two dreams, she was clearly trying to find something from her sister that she couldn't find with her mother. The fact that she had linked the second dream with coming to see me was powerful. I think she was communicating her hope that with me she could find a sister who would listen and who could love her. I needed to let her sit on the bed and talk. It was only through becoming siblings that we could effectively begin to unravel buried feelings about her mother. I had to become an ally to her, offering her a place where she could begin to talk to a sister about their mother. This was difficult as she was resistant to criticizing her mother. 
When I stepped too keenly into a more parental transference, tried to find solutions, be knowing or expect too much from her, she would either retreat or suddenly attack me. I may have become the mother who needed things from her, but I think she experienced me more as a sister trying to inhabit her mother's shoes. She was also attacking the bossy older sister, which is a part of me, a part who stands in from the mother, who tries to help by finding solutions and who wants recognition for being the wise one. What Margaret needed above all was someone who was available to listen, someone who could sit next to her on the bed as she faced her fury and desperation about her mother's unavailability. Stolper proposes that therapeutic witnessing is, quotes, an active, vital and intersubjective action that involves both patient and therapist. I had to step right in and do this with Margaret, and this involved embodying my sibling self. Sibling witnessing in group therapy. In group therapy, sibling witnessing is much more obviously and readily available. Witnessing happens in groups on two levels, in the here and now and in the transference, and it is constantly active. When individuals share past events or traumas with the group, they can revisit their experiences less alone with others who maybe touch themselves and can offer different angles and viewpoints. <clears throat> but in addition, the group will be in continual sense, a continual process of witnessing its own internal life. Group events are constantly being reworked in the group, much as happens in a family. This is a vital part of group therapy. And I'm grateful to Miriam for bringing this to the fore. I would like to share an event which happened in my once weekly therapy group some weeks ago. The group has been running for seven years and currently has seven members. The event occurred in the shadow of the Turkish earthquake. One of our members is Turkish and members of his own family were affected. So something unsettled and ominous was hanging over the group that day. Colin is going through a very difficult time and the group have been worried about him. Today, he announces that he has been offered a new job and he won't be able to come to the group any longer. He plans to leave in three weeks. The atmosphere becomes tense and the emotional temperature rises rapidly. Members anxiously try to persuade him to rethink. Can't you ask your new boss? Please give it some time. He's adamant and becomes more and more heated and angry. It's almost impossible to intervene. And he starts to rant. You just don't get it, do you? This group is important, but I can't risk my job for it. That's ridiculous. You're supposed to be supportive and understanding. I need to leave and you should be helping me. Mandy, who's sitting opposite him, begins to shout in frustration. Why don't you listen, Colin? It's a really bad idea for you to leave. You need us and you've got to think about this. Worried about the escalating emotions, I intervene, suggesting that if she speaks quieter, he might hear her better. Mandy gets up and rushes out of the room in tears, saying I'm being just like her bad teacher. Johanna, who's sitting next to her, asks if she can go and find her, and she too rushes out. No one has ever run out of the room before. The rest of the group sit for a few minutes in stunned silence, then begin to challenge me. Why couldn't I let her shout? What was I doing? Why was I trying to control things? They had a point. I was also feeling tense and anxious, and I was afraid that things were getting out of control. Maybe this reminded me of events in my own family. It was helpful to be, have been challenged, and to have a few moments to regain my equilibrium. It's not long before Mandy and Johanna return. The relief is palpable and the group begins to breathe. Colin then speaks. This is all my fault. Now you see what happens when I get angry. This is how it is at home. If I let out my feelings, my wife shouts and my son runs off. I'm right to keep things in. Surprisingly, Mandy, usually scared of raised emotions, says, actually, I'm glad it happened. It was important. I just saw red. I was seven, back in the classroom, being told I was too loud and too much and being made to stand in the corner. 
This time I took myself away. I couldn't cope with the humiliation and shame. I asked her how it felt that Johanna had gone after her. She says, it was so helpful. No one has ever noticed me before. I was feeling so alone. I felt I caused a dramatic scene as always, and I really didn't know how I was going to get back to the room. Thank you, Johanna. She is now in floods of tears. Johanna has often told us about running upstairs to her room when she was angry or feelings were heated in her family. And I say that I wonder whether she acted so quickly because she could see something of herself in Mandy. Maybe, no one ever came to find me. I used to spend hours upstairs trying to comfort myself, talking to myself. I acted impulsively just now. I didn't think about it, but maybe I knew that she needed one of us to go to her, to make it all right, to bring her back here. She paused. I wish someone had done that for me. This event has become a defining moment in, for the group. For Colin, Mandy and Johanna, the incident activated vital psychological trigger points, re-evoking moments which have constantly repeated themselves in their lives. This time, however, they were not alone. They were in the presence of witnesses, group siblings who knew them well, who could hold, contain and verify their experience. And it is this act of sibling witnessing that has been transformative. To be witnesses rather than mere bystanders, they also had to be participants. Colin's fury, which contained so much of his rage and frustration with his controlling wife, evoked resonances for everyone. The group witnessed me being pulled in, becoming their controlling mother, teacher, wife, who could reprimand and humiliate. Johanna, who could easily have reenacted her position in one of her own family dramas, acted differently, becoming an understanding sibling witness who could hold things together. And the remaining group members supported them by standing up to me as their controlling group parent, encouraging me to be alongside rather than above them and allowing Mandy and Colin to feel supported and understood rather than isolated and alone. Stolper describes this process very well. It allows reviving and reliving difficult events in the group hall of mirrors when each participant has a clear role in the enacted drama while offering an opportunity to discover and experience new reparative experience. This process requires courage and changing of past patterns and thus allows a curative process for both protagonist and participants. What was important was that we survived the earthquake together. Witnessing is a shared experience involving being alongside another. I believe it is a crucial component of all therapeutic encounters. It needs much further exploration. And I'm grateful to Miriam for bringing this to the fore in our discourse. And I'd just like to express my grateful thanks to my patient, Margaret, and to my therapy group because they all gave me permission to share this material with you. Thank you. Wow. The next presentation is will be delivered by Ivan Urlic from Croatia. He's a neuropsychiatrist, psychoanalytic psychotherapist, and group analyst. As a professor of psychiatry and psychological medicine, he teaches at the medical school of the University of Split, as well as internationally. He is a founder member of IGA Zagreb and IGA Bologna in Italy, where he is a training group analyst and supervisor. He was a chairperson of Agatin and board member of Gazi. In 2004, he was a Fuchs lecturer. He was secretary and board member of IAGP, board member of ISPS International, and is co-founder 
and Deputy President of ISP Croatia. He was president of the Dalmatian branch of the Academy of the Medical Sciences of Croatia. His special interests are group psychotherapy for patients suffering from psychosis and post-traumatic disorders. He founded Regional Center for Psychotrauma for Dalmatia for the treatment of war veterans and their family members. He has published papers and chapters in books with Miriam Berger and Avi Berman, co-author of the book, Victimhood, Vengefulness, and the Culture of Forgiveness. He co-edited and co-authored a book with Gonzalez de Chavez on group psychotherapy for, for psychosis, published in English, Spanish, and Croatian. So listen, let's listen to Eva talking about potential of the group. Please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here again and among friends and the colleagues for such a long period, which means my interest and belonging to a group analytic society. Well, uh, continuing uh, this uh, discourse started by Miriam Berger about uh, traumatic uh, facts that matter. Uh, my response will center on traumatic facts that matter and the healing potential of the group. So read, uh, reading Miriam Berger's Fuchs lecture on the importance of the facts as such, bare facts, events, remembrances of certain specific situations and relationships, I remained page after page impressed by the power of impact her life experiences might have had on the whole course of her life, either private or professional. Since her first days, the holding and attachment were entrusted to the basket. Mason's tools she was covered with and completely unknown threatening destiny. It reminded me of a reoccurrence of the Moses story of modern times. The flow of the Nile was changed by the passage of many human hands until the newborn baby found a peaceful and warm motherly protection, a miraculous salvation. Indeed, I asked myself how much these facts have influenced her to choose the topic of her lecture, not only on the conscious level, but on the pre and unconscious levels as well, being an extremely important part of her inter intrapersonal, inter and transpersonal foundations matrices, and not only of the actual matrix of her communication features. Working together <clears throat> on our book, Victimhood, Vengefulness, and the Culture of Forgiveness, written by Miriam Berger, Avi Berman, and myself, it becomes quite obvious with her sensitivity, why her sensitivity was inspired by the topic of vengefulness, how to better understand that, in quotation marks, discredited feelings, as she defined it, and how to find ways to approach it therapeutically. Later on, in my response to her lecture, I'll elaborate on these life and professional experiences that she brought to the Fuchs lecture this year. Of course, the impact of facts has additionally induced my own memories to emerge not only to be compared regarding the intensity and the traumatogenic potential of memories and feelings, but especially regarding the relative importance they played in determining some of my life choices and attitudes and in empathizing with suffering human beings. 
because indeed, just as Freud remarked that sometimes cigar means just a cigar, Miriam Berger suggests that the symbolic meaning of the expression in words should not overshadow the fact that the fact exists by itself. In Lacanian terms, it conveys the notion that the world has become concrete. It does not represent. And the anxiety in the group is a signal that the real, not reality, is here in the group. Reality is what we construct with our imaginary and symbolic dimensions. Reality exists. We can talk about it. We share it. The real is what exists, as Lacan puts it, using a term borrowed from Heidegger. It is outside human reality as constructed by language. Trying to delineate the essence of the fact, Miriam Berger calls to mind a metaphysical question that I heard in the following form. If a bell rings in the desert and there is nobody to hear it, does it ring? Probably. The first reaction would be to declare such a scene as a non-event. But Miriam Berger is warning us that events as well as non-events have consequences because the absence of a response can be very traumatogenic. But what happened, happened. The power of the terrible facts and overwhelming emotions, even if not consciously perceived or dissociated and deeply repressed, under certain circumstances, tend to create anxieties and intrapsychic tensions difficult to bear. To facilitate the empathic reading of Miriam Berger's musings and recollections, there were my experiences from the, uh, from the Croatian War of Independence, 1991-1995, and its consequences reflect, reflected in everyday life during all that time and the long shadows they cast after the war. According to the saying that when the tree falls, there is no more shadow, the reception of the enemy as a kind of non-human started to evolve into a changing perception regarding our common humanity. The veterans of war were under the protection of the physician's consulting room, sharing their hitherto encapsulated secrets. It is not easy to face the fact that a human being was killed or wounded by your own hand. Of course, the majority of my patients, war veterans, have developed PTSD with symptoms like flashbacks and nightmares. With time and again, some especially traumatogenic episodes unfolding from the life situations they experienced, leading to unbearable anxieties, depression, dysphoric states resulting in social withdrawal and permanent uh, personality changes. It was foreseeable from the beginning of armed confrontations. And I remember what the first soldiers, soldier told me about what was causing his frequent insomnia, headaches and nightmares. They, so enemies, made me become killer. It is not fair. If I survive all this, I'm quite aware that I will never be the same person again. It proved to be difficult to identify with that position of a killer, but it was part of the everyday reality in times of war. After the war, one veteran told me about the unusual burden that he didn't know how to understand and resolve. <clears throat> he was an artilleryman. <clears throat> Near the end of the war, the artillery was shelling the area behind, behind the hills, 
which later that they would clear of enemies. Entering the village that was destroyed due to the shelling of his unit, he saw the corpse of a child under burning beams and was completely disgusted by the pungent smell of burning human flesh. Later on, after returning home, he had an unusual experience. In the middle of an orgasm, he would sense the smell of burnt human flesh and see a picture of the child from that devastated village. In order to avoid the, that scene and that feeling of a smell, he would try to end the intercourse as quickly as possible. His wife became suspicious and accused him of having a mistress. He was desperate, but he couldn't tell her that he was a killer of little children while he was experiencing that and other similar war events. It is generally considered that it is either very difficult or quite impossible to identify even partially with a person who has killed another human being. Especially many snipers were aware of facts and pictures of liquidated enemies that kept returning in their nightmares, dreams, and flashbacks. In years after the war in Croatia, we had an increased number of incidents of violent behavior among war veterans, either as shooting and killing in public or as suicidal behavior. According to my experience, it was mostly about non-elaborated traumatogenic experiences that resulted in great difficulties in managing aggressive impulses inspired by war experiences. I decided to organize a therapeutic group of war veterans who were aware that they had killed one of the enemy and who were haunted by vivid recollections of these events. Whilst preparing, them, whilst preparing them for the group psychotherapy, I was feeling deeply their pains and their reluctance to share these traumatic facts even with themselves as recollections, to say nothing about sharing them with others, and often even with the psychiatrist, uh, often with the psychiatrist as well. Trusting me, under my suggestion, some of my patients agreed to join the group, but told me that I shouldn't be surprised if they were to remain silent, especially regarding the most terrible events such as killing. As a matter of fact, uh, no one of the group members could resist longer than the third session before confessing the most devastating facts from their war experiences, such as killing another human being. One of the most dramatic episodes was told by a young ex-soldier who spent four years in the war. During one battle, he was leaving his unit to protect him from behind, while he was crawling through a minefield to reach the enemy's machine gas, uh, gun nest. The commander of that enemy position happened to be his school friend. They had even sat on the same bench. He killed them all. There were six persons. The school friend said, you don't want to kill me. And he answered, you will be the first. You wouldn't spare me either. During his telling of the story, his tics became something like a tetoid movements and sudden jerks and he remained in high tension like everybody else. The group moved in the direction of opening up, not just very anxiety provoking, but direct aggressive feelings connected to family stories about killing 
perpetrated by enemies of family members from previous generations. Living with all these stories, many of them were ashamed that their family members were, as they would say, killed, killed like sheep and were longing for revenge. Intergenerational transmission of wounds containing aggressive feelings showed an unusual strength and resilience when attempts were made to confront and interpret them. There was long silence in the group. Some of the group members were nodding and some were adding some short episodes from their similarly traumatic experiences. Slowly, the atmosphere in the group changed into a depressive one. It seemed as if the naked, aggressive feelings and deep anxieties were finding their ways to start the mourning process. Within the group, members were able to speak more openly about sadness and not only about terrible episodes, followed by feelings of emptiness and boredom. Episodes, epi episodes like this one indicated that sadness could be approached and felt, but still not named. According to Bashoglu, the fear of a threat to safety and loss of control over life appeared to be the most important mediating factors in PTSD and depression. This finding might have important implications for reconciliation efforts in post-war societies and effective interventions for traumatized war survivors. In these situations, as Kernberg wrote, vengefulness is a typical characterological form of hatred. Inter interesting in this context is the perception that in addition to the work of mourning to retrieve the lost libido, the patient must do the work of hating to liberate his aggression from continued service to the past. Forgiveness is accomplished by revisiting the aggression that has been stirred up by the desire to revenge and by redirecting aims towards a new goal. Here, regarding the bare facts, the idea of the alternations between work of mourning and the work of hating might be interesting. The process of witnessing and depositing it in the group matrix reveals a specially delicate position for the role of the conductor. This group work can evolve for a short time in the phase when the group may enter the role of the conductor. The deep mutual understanding and empathic experiencing of the past with all its accompanying emotional turmoil can lead to a deeper understanding of bygones in the original contexts. This can bring about the passing of the wish to revenge. I support the idea that freedom of terror and hatred from the past means the regained ability to sublimate aggressive feelings, thus allowing human relations to continue in a more productive and positive way, in spite of the facts that matter as such, and their social, ethical, religious, and other possible meanings. According to the psychotherapeutic experiences, it might be said that in spite of the great obstacles that hard feelings of rational and irrational guilt and shame in sharing the deep wounds caused by extreme violence against human, humans, it is possible to create an atmosphere of caring and protection that enables the wounded person to regain his or her sense of or for life. 
In these circumstances, I am constantly reminded of the Fuchs's recommendation, trust the group. But in order to achieve that level of a working group, Miriam Berger reminds us of the horizontal axis that Juliet Mitchell defined as the law of the mother, which she sees as fundamental in human development. She differentiates the law of the father as the vertical axis guaranteeing structure and order, and the law of the mother, the horizontal axis that is aimed at preventing incest and harmful acts between siblings. In that frame of reference, she underscores her message, trust the facts. They do exist. Through the group work, they can be reached by sharing our realities, perceptions, and feelings. Berger believes that once the horizontal axis is created, it becomes independent from the vertical one, which relates to relations with parents. She suggests that the view that horizontality affords in conjunction with mutual witnessing in the analytic group restores one's sense of belonging to the social matrix of concern among equal others. It is my impression and conviction that after experiencing Krakow, Radka, and that other terrible experiences which occurred in her life, blended with the professional experiences and knowledge together with other life events and circumstances, it is not surprising that Miriam Berger felt what she named as empathic unsettlement. Being partly conscious of her own episodes, which might be called destiny and vicissitudes at the edge of the survival abyss, she was at the same time outlining the vicissitudes of the Holocaust survivors of the Jewish people. But even some tiny traces might lead to the resolution of some misty or missing parts of her life story and point to the importance, besides psychoanalytic and group analytic attitudes, of taking into consideration conscious and unconscious, transferential and counter-transferential, realistic and symbolic, intrapersonal, inter- and transpersonal features, basic assumptions preceding a work group, and other concepts and theories that attempt to clarify the human existence in the context of different groups. It is the remarkable ability of our lecturer today, oh, yesterday, let's say, that she can shed light on facts as such that matter and on the importance of testimony in the service of connecting our realities with the real. Thank you, Miriam, for helping us to get away from empathic unsettlement due to encapsulated traumatic experiences either of war itself or of civilian origin, facing the sharing of bare facts in the same framework of the protective law of the mother and of the structural law of the father, that is, with the testimony that turns the non-events into a shared reality in the search of the real and for the reality which matters. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Well, we we already get into the, the time of lunch. So I suggest us to to bring some at least one question from here and one from the online, not to 